Dr. Kirsten Benkendorf. Professor Kirsten is the Deputy Director of the Marine Ecology Research Center and the School Director of Higher Degree Research in Environment, Science and Engineering, Southern Cross University, Australia. She is an interdisciplinary researcher focused on assessing the bioresource value of marine invertebrates. Special thanks to Dr. Vijayan for inviting me to speak here today and um, thanks to all of the organising committee for putting on such a wonderful conference. I'm presenting today some work that's been undertaken by a couple of my PhD students here as co-authors, Endurance and Peter, and we're investigating the risks of pesticide associated with prawn, shrimp aquaculture and oyster aquaculture. I think an area which is relatively neglected. So you can see here, uh, we've got our prawns and our oysters, and they're often grown in these areas of intensive agriculture. And agriculture often uses pesticides, which of course can get into the water and therefore exposed to these organisms. Now, we're all, I guess, well aware of the fact that water quality is essential for good aquaculture. And of course, disease is one of the major limiting factors in aquaculture. And just to illustrate the problem, um, when I was in Vietnam last year, uh, my colleague was actually called out to a farm and by the time we got there, there was already 80% mortality. When we investigated the, um, the water and the prawns, we found that there was no obvious pathogen, that there was a lot of um, opportunistic vibrios and the like. Looking more detail into the water, we did actually uh, detect that there were potential pesticides in the water, and what we found was that in this particular farm, they had abandoned a lot of ponds because they'd previously experienced the same problem where the prawns were just reaching a certain age and then dying. When we investigated the sediment in some of these abandoned ponds, we found a chemical called aldicarb, which is actually a carbonate, pesti a carbonate pesticide which has been banned from distribution in many places. So the problem here is that we're dealing with a lot of land-based ag agriculture and not necessarily able to control what's getting into the shrimp farms. And this can contribute both chronic and acute stress. Of course, there's also a potential risk to human health if these chemicals are getting into the, the products themselves that we eat. When I was in Vietnam, I was also fortunate to visit some of these different forms of um, farming, which did involve both rotational rice shrimp farms and integrated rice prawn farming. And in these particular cases, the farmers do actually have some control over what they grow their rice with and whether they actually use pesticides. And I was lucky to meet some farmers down in Kamoi, um, these farmers here which have moved to an organic model of growing rice. And it was actually their belief that the only way to grow rice organically was to integrate with prawns or shrimp. Um, so this was very interesting and I think it's probably the way of the future for a lot of these smaller scale farmers. But the reality at the moment is that most rice farms are actually spraying with pesticides. And of course, it's not just rice. In Australia, we grow sugar in coastal areas, and uh, a lot of these are, are generating runoff into estuarine areas where shrimp are grown. And of course, pesticides are used in a huge range of different fruit and vegetable crops, and often these are delivered through aerial spraying where there's a, lot of, a lack of control over where they actually end up. Of course, the target of pesticides are insects, and there's a whole range of different insects, pests, which are in the phylum Arthropoda. And we well know that there are actually non-target organisms, such as honeybees, which have generated a lot of publicity because of the negative impacts. There have been a few studies on aquatic invertebrates that also de um, demonstrate there are negative impacts on these non-target organisms, but surprisingly few studies on our prawns and our shrimp despite the fact that they're in the same phylum of arthropoda. They share the same central nervous system and therefore are likely to be equally successful, as susceptible to these pesticides. I was also interested in the mollusks. Um, oysters are actually grown uh, much more frequently in New South Wales, where I am in these estuarine areas, than are prawns or sh and shrimp. And these guys also uh, filter feed and therefore have the potential for bioaccumulation. And there's been very little research done on these. We did a review and we were particularly focused on neonicotinide pesticides, which are actually the dominant pesticides that are sold at the moment, uh, about 80% of all worldwide pesticide sales. And when you look at the um, red bars, you can see very little, which is actually uh, previous research, on cr commercial crustaceans that involve the neonicotinides. There has been some research done on, on organophosphates and pyrethroids and a bit on organochlorides.
but to date only four published studies on the effects of these neonicotinoids on crustaceans, and there's been just three studies that look, on the, look at the effects on bivalves. So what are neonicotinoids? They're systemic neuroactive insecticides. They were developed in around the 1990s to replace organophosphates and carbamates due to the toxic side effects of those compounds, but also the fact that many insects were developing resistance. The neonicotinoids are actually really potent at very low concentrations and have now been registered and are used in over 120 countries around the world. They are used in a huge range of pesticide formulations, some of which are for large-scale agricultural use, but they're also used in some domestic products, for example, for treating um, ticks and fleas. And they're also used um, in lawn care treatment, um, by golf courses, by councils, um, in parks and gardens, and ultimately there's potential for, for runoff from both urban areas as well as agricultural areas. So this is what they look like. They're derived from nicotine. Um, imidacrylid was the first one that was developed and now we have a huge range of structural analogues that are on the market and a couple of new ones which have been developed specifically to be less resistant to sunlight degradation. So they have longer half-lives in the environment. Their mode of action is to target the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Um, so you can see the normal firing of a nerve cell involves acetylcholine going from the transmitting neuro neuron it binds to the receiving neuron. And when the signal has actually been transmitted, an acetylcholine esterase um, enzyme will break down the receptor um, bind with the um, ligand and recycle those products back into the cell. But when we have a neonicotinide present, it binds to those same receptors, but the acetylcholine esterase can't break it down. And this means that the nerve cell is continuously switched on and it's firing. And ultimately, this will result in a whole range of problems, both at a biochemical level and behavioral problems, ultimately leading to death of the organisms. There have been detected sublethal effects on a huge range of other organisms, including humans, um, and a few studies that are actually starting to come out on crustaceans and these filter-feeding bivalves. So the pathways for contamination involve um, pesticides that are injected into trees. They can be sprayed onto crops. They can actually be used as soil drenches, and they're frequently used as sea coatings, for example, in rice. They build up in the leaves and the fruit, and uh, they build up in the soil and um, then they can actually run off and they can also get into the groundwater and leach through the groundwater, end up in aquatic environments where, of course, they kill things. Um, neonicotinoids can actually accumulate in plant material for over seven years and they've been shown to accumulate in the soil for two years. Their half-life in the water column actually depends on things such as the turbidity of the water, but they can be quite uh, persistent. What we do see is um, whole uh, sort of cycles, a temporal variation in the levels that are actually detected in water. Um, so here we can see examples of high pulse exposure whoops, um, after uh, uh, um, planting episodes, and at other times of the year we may actually see low chronic exposure. And the levels that are detected also depend on things such as rainfall events. We did a review looking at the global de um, detection of these compounds in um, coastal waters and there have been 36 studies published in Europe and levels of up to 320 micrograms per litre were detected and a number of these uh, neonicotinides are actually now restricted for use in um, Europe. In America, they were detected in levels up to 225 micrograms per litre and they are currently under review with respect to their use. In Africa, there have been no, no studies. In Asia, um, there were 12 studies and they're only getting around um, 100, uh, 1.5 micrograms per litre. I think it, um, this is partly because there's still a lot of use of other types of pesticides like organophosphates, but there's also a lack of both spatial and temporal studies in Asia that might pick them up in peak areas at peak times. Um, so they're not currently restricted for use in Asia or under review. In Australia, there's just been one study, and this study did detect them in concentrations up to 4.5 micrograms per um, litre. The use of neonicotinides is increasing in Australia, so we expect the problem to get worse, and there is no plan to review their status in Australia at the moment. In terms of their endpoints, they have been shown to affect a huge range of different endpoints in, um, in arthropods, but also in crustaceans. They can inhibit feeding, and they can initiate cannibalism. Um, they can interfere with molting and growth rates, and they can affect a whole range of different biochemical markers, including the acetylcholine esterase enzymes, as well as antioxidant and um, protein and lipids.
Ultimately, all of these um, indicate that neonicotinoids cause stress and this increases the risk of disease. Having a look at the lethal effects on some non-target aquatic organisms, um, for imidac propylide, the main um, ecotoxicology organism that's used for aquatic studies is Daphnia. And this species actually happens to be fairly um, resistant to neonicotinoids with a really high EC50. It is more sensitive when it's molting. But when we start to look at some other organisms, we see much lower EC50s. So the constant use of Daphnia as an um, ecotoxicology indicator is probably not very wise, particularly when we actually start to look at some of these seafood crustacean species. Here we see significantly lower EC50s when we're looking at the effects on molting and looking at the effects of, um, of the imidacroplide on feeding of prawns or shrimp, um, we see an EC50 right down to 0.5 micrograms per litre. So it's important to recognise that these effects on these commercial crustaceans are well within the environmental um, detection range, ranges that have been found in numerous countries, including Australia. Um, the next question, I guess, is whether or not they accumulate in the flesh and potentially cause a problem for human consumption. There's only been one study, and this is not a commercially um, consumed seafood species, but it has shown that they can be retained in the flesh for up to 11 days, and there was a significant ne negative correlation between the internal concentrations and the wet weight of these organisms. At present, I guess there's not a lot of recognition that these pesticides could be a problem in seafood, so there's actually no maximum tolerable dose that's been established by food authorities in either the US or Australia as of yet. Um, so we were interested in exploring and quantifying these compounds. We've used standard catcher extraction. We can detect them by liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. We can see a characteristic UV profile and we can pick up the mass spec ions and we can actually get different um, fragmentation patterns depending on which compound is actually present. So we're able to distinguish the different compounds and their metabolites. Um, we are able to show that we can detect them, so this is actually just a, a control of the imidacrochloride for comparison. Um, oysters, when we've got the basic oyster flesh, you can see it's not present in our control oysters, but when we actually expose the oysters to the compound, uh, we get a clear peak here with the right UV profile and the right mass spec signal. So using this method, we were actually able to successfully quantify the um, neonicotinides. Uh, this data set on prawns is actually only just coming in, so we haven't finished analysing it yet, but you can see that we were able to detect it um, when we exposed them up to four micrograms per litre of um, imidacropylide, we were able to detect it in nanogram concentrations with no clear dose effect. Um, but we've done more studies on the oyster, and after two weeks of exposure, we were able to demonstrate that they did actually accumulate up to eight um, micrograms per gram um, in their tissues, and there was a clear dose effect with higher levels detected in the adductor muscle. We undertook an uptake and dip depuration experiment, and you can see the first three days they accumulate the compound pretty quickly, and I guess what's really interesting is that the maximum tolerable limit um, that's set by the food and drugs uh, authorities for meat is 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. So we're detecting well above that level in the oysters just after a couple of days of exposure. Um, so this is a, a meat limit, there's no limit set for seafood yet, as I mentioned before. But what's really promising is that we can get rid of them really quickly as well. So they take it up quickly, but after one day depuration in clean water, the, limit, the levels really drop back very quickly and basically none was detected four days later. We also used this technique called mass spec imaging and we were able to look at the distribution of the compounds in the different tissues of the organism. And what we found is that it's largely associated with the um, digestive gland and the gills. And we were also able to detect a couple of metabolites and we found that it was metabolized differently in the digestive gland where it's generating a hydroxy compound to the gills where it's generating an olefin um, metabolite. So this is very interesting to see that they've got different detoxification um, pathways switched on in the different organs. To explore this further, we undertook some differential gene expression. And we exposed them to two micrograms per litre of imidacropylide. And we, um, on the left here, we've got our treated oysters compared to our control oysters on the right. And we detected over 2,000 differentially expressed genes. Some of the upregulated genes included cargo, cargo receptor activity and scavenger receptor activity, indicating that they are actually making this effort to detoxify the compounds.
And we also found down-regulated genes, including phosphate activity and dephosphorylation genes, as well as really interestingly, genes to do with cilium motility and the axonym in the cilium. So this is really important with respect to feeding activity, considering the, the activity of the cilia in the feeding process, but it also has potential implications for the reproductive life stages, both the flagella of sperm and the cilia in larvae. So some of the next studies that we'll be doing will be looking at these early life stages. We also found some genes that were upregulated um, in certain isoforms and downregulated in other isoforms, and this included the acetylcholine esterase receptors, as well as a whole range of um, stress and heat, uh, immune related genes, including heat shock proteins and toll like receptors. And the cytochrome um, P450 is re um, responsible for some of the detoxification and relevant to that metabolis uh, metabolite that we found in the digestive gland. Um, so just to conclude, neonicotinoids are a threat to both shellfish and um, the consumers because they can actually be uptaken into the, um, into the flesh. We do need to do a lot more studies to detect which pesticides are actually um, relevant to shellfish, including shrimp and um, oysters, in different catchments where there's different agricultural activities. These neonicotinoids are being increasingly detected in coastal waters, and we can see negative impacts on the organisms at environmentally relevant com um, concentrations. They can also absorb into the flesh at concentrations that exceed maximum tolerable limits for, um, for meat. Uh, but very fortunately, we can actually depurate when we put the um, oysters into clean water. Um, so some of the ongoing work involves um, looking at the pesticides in and around shrimp farms and uh, I have actually just been collaborating with some researchers from SEBA to see if we can't actually get a grant to do this research in India as well. Um, more ecotoxicology is uh, needed depending on the types of pesticides that we actually find and we need to look uh, further into some of these sublethal effects and the reproductive stages and the immune systems to look at that interaction with disease. Um, we also ultimately want to look not just at the problem, but also at solutions. Um, so bioremediation uh, um, options, actually working, down, working out how we might be able to prevent them getting into the farms or to break them down once they do actually get into the farms. Um, so this is really just putting it all together. I'll skip over that. And um, thank you very much for your attention.